There is a secret to becoming a good inker. It's called repetition and patience. I'm using my pen and a rather coarse pen to do the outlines of the drawings. And as I work, as I'm working with my pen, as I'm applying the line work, I'm also trying to get a feeling of roundness, solidity, dimension on the figure. If I think of this as a flat figure, then the drawing will come out looking flat, and that's exactly what I don't want. I use the stroke of the brush as an expression of roundness. I'm following the form of the arm with the rendering of the brush. Almost like sculpting. It's, it's like uh, uh, attempting to get a three-dimensional form or a three-dimensional impression out of a flat piece of paper. I can twist and turn the drawing so that it's more comfortable for me to render with the brush or pen. One of the most important elements involved is to determine a source of light. The source of light will tell you where the light is emanating from and where the shadows fall. And that has to be consistent all the way through the drawing. I have the light source coming from above the drawing, therefore the inside of the forearm is in shadow, the under part of the biceps is in shadow, the armpit is in shadow, underneath the rib cage is in shadow. Now in order to really get a clear impression of the finished drawing, I'm, I'm erasing the pencils now. We here at Joe Cuber's World of Cartooning want to thank you for taking part in this course. Listen carefully to Joe's tips and instructions and apply these ideas to your own work. And now, here's Joe. Hi. Welcome to my studio. This is where I work. This is the place I like being the most. I hope you enjoy drawing as much as I do. Yeah, I know sometimes it's tough. Sometimes the drawing doesn't come out precisely the way you'd like. But if you want to improve your drawing, I'm here to help you. You, however, have to make the effort. I'll be with you every step of the way, and we'll both watch your drawings improve as we go along. So, get your video, hand your workbook, set them up, and let's get started. Cartooning goes back hundreds of years. Even the great masters like Michelangelo did cartoons, that is, a series of illustrations that tell a story. The Egyptians used hieroglyphics to tell of their history. American Indians used petroglyphs, drawings on stone. Storytelling in picture form goes further back than that, to the time of the caveman. They decorated cave walls with ritual hunting scenes, 
animal stampedes. Those were our earliest cartoonists. To begin with, you'll need to set yourself up a workplace so that it's both comfortable and convenient. Set up your drawing surface, whether it's a table or a lap board, so that it's at a 90 degree angle from your eyes. If it is not at this 90 degree angle, your drawings will seem distorted. If you don't have a drawing table or even a lap board to start working with, use the carton that your lessons came with. Just set it up on your lap and draw on that. Remember now, keep your materials neat and near at hand. Uh, keep your sketch paper close by so that should you need it, you've got it. Also, I keep all my references handy in files like this. Set up your VCR where it can be easily seen and where you can operate it because you're going to need it to constantly refer back and forth between the workbook and the video. That's the way you're going to get the most out of this course. You'll find that there is a blank sheet of drawing paper inserted between each lesson page in your course book. In addition, you'll need plenty of plain, letter-sized bond and tracing paper for practice. Remember to do all your rough sketching on practice paper before you put your finished drawing on the two-ply boards provided for your homework. As you finish each of the lessons in this course, you'll be sending them in to us one at a time for review, instructive criticism, and a lot of encouragement. Send in only the special homework page because no other sketches or drawings will be reviewed. The homework page goes into the pre-addressed mailer and it will be returned to you with our comments the same way. We will only review your work in sequence. That is, lesson one must be completed and returned before we'll deal with lesson two. It's essential for you to review our comments and instructions on one lesson before you tackle the next. Comic Book Art is usually produced by a team of people, a writer, a penciler, an inker, letterer, and colorist all contribute their expertise. But generally speaking, inking is the final procedure in creating cartoon drawings, and this course deals specifically with inking. In the past, black and white drawings were the easiest and least expensive ways of reproducing art for publication, and the same tools have been used for hundreds of years. Let me show you the tools of the trade. They are exactly like those used by all the professionals I know. These are the two types of pens that I use. This is the packet of nibs that come with the set. The blue brush is specifically for ink. This particular brush is made from special hairs that hold together. What I've done now is just kind of soften it and gotten the, the starch out of it which holds the brush together until you use it. It's the same thing on the white brush. This, this smaller brush is specifically for white paint. This in the ink should be shaken before use. Ink has a tendency to separate if it's sitting for any length of time. That is the sediment separates from the liquid. And if you don't shake it and stir it, what will happen is that you'll be working with a very gray, watery kind of ink rather than the black that it's intended to. This is the white paint. The white paint is used for corrections. And the white paint should have a consistency very near to sour cream. And when you apply this, it should work as an opaque and cover up any mistakes the nibs. They're used for a variety of things. This particular point is used for lettering and for drawing. It's a stiff nib 
These are the B5s and the B6s because you want a consistently straight line that has no deviation in terms of thicknesses. You use a stiff pen like this for lettering. And of course it's used for drawing as well. These pens come with a thin coating of some chemical to retard uh, rusting and so on. And so it's a good idea to wash it off first. Wash it off gently and dry it on a cloth or on a paper towel. Don't push or shove it around because these things can be damaged very, very easily. What we have here is a drawing pen. It's a little bit more flexible than the lettering pen. This is the crow quill. This is the fine point. There, it has a particular flexibility. Um, be careful that you don't catch it. Be careful that you don't break it. They are susceptible to breaking if you put too much pressure on them. Dry them off as I'm showing you. The action should be wi of, of wiping. Now, this is important too. You notice I bent the towel and I'm now drying the inside of the point. And I'm pulling it down. Watch again. I'm pulling it down in order to get any excess moisture. The pen point has a tendency to spread. If you invert the pen and press the other way, the tendency will be to pull the two edges of the point together again. Have two cups of water by your side when you're using these tools. One is for ink and the other is for white paint. Never mix the two together. And you notice when I dry these brushes, I do not rub them, I do not squeeze them, I dry them to a point. Again, when you open up the bottle of ink, shake it gently before you open. You should do this every time you use the ink. Sometimes just shaking it a little bit is not enough. If the sediment is really separated, you will find a blob of almost like uh, a mud or a gelatinous substance. You would have to mix it with a stirrer. How far do you dip it? Perhaps halfway into the bottle because actually what you're using is merely the point. You are not, the time that you're using the barrel or the uh, heaviest part of the brush is when you're getting the thickest stroke. But the tendency for uh, us cartoonists is actually to be using the point of the brush more than the barrel itself. Clean out the brush as I'm showing it to you because the moment it starts to dry where the hair meets the metal, it's very difficult to clean it out. Never leave the brush lay in the jar itself. It'll ruin the brush. Dip the point just to the hole in the nib. You'll notice that with a, new, with a new pen, invariably, it's difficult to get the proper flow. It takes a little time before there's a proper flow of ink coming out of the point. So just keep working it, not pressing too hard, merely touching the paper. You'll find that after a while, you'll get a longer, smoother stroke with your pen nib uh, when the ink starts running properly. And any new pen, any new tool has to be broken in. Uh, the ink uh, has a tendency to dry even while you're working and cause your, your pen nib to give a thicker and thicker line as you work along. So every once in a while you'll find it necessary to actually wash off the pen while you're using it. Wash off the pen, clean it off to get the proper point. Now let's you and I put these tools to work with some practice strokes. They're the same strokes you'll be using when you ink your own drawings. These are practice lines, strictly practice lines. A thick and thin stroke, and I'm doing a cross stroke now. What I'm doing is pulling the brush across the paper. And you will find that when you use the brush, the handle is usually pointing 
in the direction that you're pulling the line. I'm pressing down to get a thick and thin line. And this is good practice. Give yourself a chance to learn this. Have patience because learning to use these particular tools is not easy. Don't become frustrated or disgusted. All it takes is a little patience and practice. What I'm trying to do here is to get these lines, thick and thin lines, as close as I possibly can without touching. What I'm doing now is a chop stroke. Um, they're used in many parts of drawings to turn a form from light to dark. Now I'm doing this with a thinner stroke. It's a softer uh, combination of lines which gives a, uh, a feeling of roundness but not as intense as the darker line. I'm getting darker and darker. I'm putting my lines down darker and darker with each form that I'm putting down. And that's a good series of practices. Now here I'm practicing stipple with a brush. Why don't I use a brush all the time? You'll find yourself doing things with this pen that you never thought you would be capable of doing. Just relax while you're doing it. Don't press too hard. Experiment as easily as possible. Be careful when dipping your pen into the ink because the more ink you put on the pen, the more apt you are to get a big blob of ink falling right out of the pen onto your paper. Dip your pen no more than halfway into the ink at any time. You'll notice that even here, the ink is coming off rather heavily. So you've got to be careful how deeply you dip into the ink and the way you apply it to the paper. Be careful about your smudging. You'll notice that as I draw, I make sure that my hand doesn't come in contact with the work that I've already done. You've always got to be aware of that, and believe me, I still find myself smearing and smudging the inks. It happens to everyone. I could do this with the brush, but it's just a lot easier to control the width of the line to get the same size line. It's a lot easier to do that with the B5. You can get a thick and thin line. What I'm doing is merely tilting the pen point forward. And in that way, I can get a variation. This is not done by pressure because these pens are too stiff. And then I can do a stipple work with the pen. But because of the thick point, the stipple will be much cruder than if I were doing it with a uh, croquil. You can work this kind of stipple into texture, into different material, like stone or concrete or soil. And I'm trying to make a form that goes from light to dark. Every one of these exercises applied to doing real drawing. All of the strokes that are being used are directly applicable to any drawing that you do. The question often comes up, what should I use, a pen or a brush, and when? Well, it depends on your own preference, but regardless, it's important to learn how to use every tool well. Okay, this is going to be a practice session with the pen and brush. And for practice, we're going to be using a piece of tracing paper over a finished ink drawing. We're going to tape this down, because if it starts to move, it'll distort the drawing completely. I'm going to start the inking process by using my pen to do an outline. 
and I'm following the lines of the drawing precisely. As I'm drawing, I'm trying to analyze the lines that were originally on the drawing, determining a um, light source where the shadows will fall, thickness of lines, construction. I use the pen first because my tendency is to work from light to dark, the pen being the lightest, and then I'll be using the brush. Is this sort of a procedure or method you usually use by starting with this pen? Yeah. Uh, one of the basic reasons for that is uh, if the light line that I'm putting down doesn't quite work, I can always darken that. But if I start with a really dark line and I want to make it lighter, that becomes difficult. I'm using a croquil here for final line work. I'm working with brush in this particular area of the drawing simply because the brush helps me get the kind of texture that I'm looking for in the hair. What I attempt to do is to get a feeling of roundness. And you'll notice that the lines that I use reinforce the roundness of the figure because the light source is from above and it casts shadows on the arms, on the face, underneath the cheeks. The highlights on the hair are affected in the same manner and has to be consistent with the light source. Would you ever fill in big black areas like that with the pen? No, I wouldn't because it would probably take three times as long uh, if you didn't put holes in it to begin with. Never fill in the black area with a pen. You're not just tracing what's underneath, you're still redrawing for the shapes yes. while you're inking. Yeah, and that's true whether you're inking on somebody else's pencils or your own. Um, inking on a pencil drawing is not a matter of tracing. There are variations of line and variations of weights of rendering that give a three-dimensionality to a figure and a validity to a figure. This practice is good because inking over somebody else's inking line for line gives you an opportunity to really analyze the inker's work and the basic drawing itself. You know, each one of us sees and feels things differently. And therefore we express ourselves artistically in different ways. Now remember, your style is as unique as your own handwriting and it's constantly developing. Effective rendering of textures is extremely important in cartoon illustration. Rendering textures correctly gives dimension, credibility, and a lifelike quality to an object. Watch this. I'm outlining the objects that I'm later going to, going to render a little bit more completely with, with brush and pen. I'm working from light to dark. When I'm, when I'm using the pen, I kind of try to get the feel of the objects. So I may put some extraneous lines in that I'll either cover up or perhaps even take out when the drawing is finished. I've done crocodiles any number of times. I realize that 
the teeth of the crocodile are not equal all the way through through its jaws. Do you do research to find out packs like that? Yeah. Uh, reference is extremely important in order to get a feel of what these animals actually look like. And you can't get that with just one or two pieces of reference. You've got to get as many photographs of the reference material that you possibly can and showing different angles of the object to get a three-dimensional feel for the animal. Almost looks like you're using sort of a raggedy line. I'm trying to feel my way along as I'm inking uh, to feel how the scales on the crocodile or the skin of the crocodile would work. You'll notice that as I'm inking, I don't follow my lines precisely. In some cases, even leave out some of the pencil lines. I'm trying to draw almost as much as I drew with my pencil. When we see an object or a figure in front of us, the only way that you're able to see the object is in contrast to whatever is behind the object. There is no definite outline. So those broken lines help to blend it into the background. Exactly. And what I'm doing is, by not completing the figure, I'm asking my audience to help me. You fill in the parts of the drawing that I don't do. So sometimes you're really just suggesting the most important parts. Well, take a look at the rendering on the bushes that I'm doing now. These are leaves. But if you take a close look, they're really very simple lines, and what I'm leaving out is probably more important than what I'm putting in. Now look at the bushes that I'm putting in the background. Those are bushes, aren't they? I could do that. Anybody could do that. No big deal. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is to get a roundness, a feeling of three-dimensionality. The black makes it look like there's a lot of depth there that goes back in, doesn't it? Yeah. I think in cartooning, the strongest colors are black and white. You know, it's the care that I'm taking, that even though the, the rendering is comparatively simple, I'm not just throwing the, I'm not doing it too quickly, I'm not just throwing the textures around. I'm very carefully building my drawing. What I'm doing now is merely a piece of the entire drawing. So you're kind of looking at the all over drawing as well as the spot that you're inking important. at the same time? That's of. very important. The artist has to be looking with perhaps two different sets of eyes one where you're concentrating on where that brush is going. With the other set of eyes, you're seeing how what you're doing there fits into the overall illustration. Now you notice that the biggest waves, the heaviest waves, are those that are in the foreground. In the distance, the waves get smaller and smaller, and I use less and less black, because if I use the same amount, it would have a tendency to flatten out. And where the black in the mouth seem to make it go farther away, the black here seems to push that part of the subject into the foreground. Right. And it might have worked differently. If I had decided to put blacks in the background, then I would have lightened the foreground. Textures are extremely important when rendering animals especially. They give dimension and a feeling of lifelikeness to the drawing. See? <laughs> <laughs> Light and shadow is critical in a black and white medium like cartoon illustration. It can add punch and give life to an otherwise flat line drawing.
It's important, once you've made a determination of where the light is and how intense the light is, to have it affect all the parts of the face with a consistency. By that I mean, if you forget to leave the shadows underneath the cheekbones or the shadow underneath the nose and just put shadows in the eyes, the eyes will suddenly look like two holes in the head. Now, as I get to the bottom, the shadows get deeper and deeper. To introduce a gray area, I can do that by just adding lines with my croquil. This is a matter of style. I think that the drawing of the head would work just as well without the rendering, but it depends on how you feel the drawing should look. My intention is to blacken in this whole background to show that despite the fact that I'm concealing a good part of that figure, that the figure will still remain complete. And as a matter of fact, uh, will give more of an impression of the entire figure than if I did it all in detail. Seem to have more dimension. If you've worked your light source correctly and it's consistent, it will take on, I think, a, a lot more credibility. Humor demands a light touch, simpler and cleaner treatment, but that doesn't make it easy. Knowing what to leave out in a drawing is even more important than knowing what to put in. What I'm doing now is more in an animated uh, style, and that calls for a really simple kind of illustration. And so you see I'm using a very simple, clean line to finish the rendering on this. There are styles of humor, incidentally, uh, that are more detailed. Uh, humor has as many variations in style as does uh, what we call straight cartoon illustration. I find pen a lot more controllable, but there are animators that I know who use a brush as effectively. Those construction lines still show how the anatomy of the figure should be, the movement of the figure, and when the inking is done, there's a selection being made of which lines and what variations of lines should be chosen. In rendering humor, it's really important to remember that less is more. Now, lettering is an integral part of a panel's composition. Here are some basics. After the pencil drawing is done, the next step is to square the page up with your T-square and tape the paper down. You don't want it moving. Place the AIMS guide on the area that you've prescribed for the lettering.
there are numbers scrolled at the bottom uh, that I'm pointing to now. Set the aims guide at three and a half. You then use the second row down. Put your pencil in, draw it across using the T-square as your guide for the aims guide. Put it into alternating holds to get the guidelines for lettering. Now, the lettering is done with the B6 pen, getting a rough idea from your layouts in pencil of the amount of space that each word is going to take. This takes practice also. In fact, before you even attempt to letter, the best thing to do is to draw a whole series of guidelines, fill up a whole page, and just do the alphabet. And you don't have to know how to draw it to letter. But it is also important to maintain a consistency with your letters. And even if they're different from the way anybody else would letter them, they'll still look correct if they're consistent. They can also be a form of expression. Can't they help to enhance certain aspects of the story? By uh, making that bolder, and I've used the uh, B5 to do that, it gives the impression to the reader that that should be said louder or there's a stress on that word that makes it more important than the rest of the text. You slanted a little too. Yeah, just to make it look a little different. And, I, and the reason it's slanted is because if I do it straight up and down, the thicker letter has a tendency to look crowded. And if I slant a little bit, I find that I have a little bit more room. Now I use the B6 to do the balloons. I want to make sure that the balloons have enough space around the words so that the words will not look crowded. Sound effects, the way you letter sound effects, should approximate the actual sound. You notice that now I'm using a thicker pen, which should give the connotation that the scream gets louder at this point. Actually, the lettering should give the effect to the reader of the sound that the sound effect is making. I'm now going to put the borders on. I use my triangle to draw in my borders, being careful not to put too much ink in the pen or else it will run under the triangle. Now you're lettering and your bordering is done. The last step is just to erase the pencil marks. Now I'm ready to start inking.
Notice the care I'm taking with uh, putting the blacks up against the balloons and up against the borders. It's important to have those lines as clean as possible, remembering that if I do mess it up or smear it, I've always got my bottle of white paint. But you don't get sloppy because you don't want your work full of white paint Well, you want rough to edges, right? You want to try to keep it as clean as possible. Don't be afraid to make a mistake because those mistakes are repairable. It's important not to be too frightened of the work that you do. Okay now, let me give you some inside hints on a few interesting techniques. These involve different ways that some pros go about making corrections. Now the balloon is not quite right, it just doesn't meet. The bottom of that balloon is a little bit off, so I'm going to correct it. And notice that the correction on the balloon is now affected without having to have to use the white paint. This is a form of correction I'm using by just slicing off the paper, bending the paper and just slicing it with a brand new razor just to get the surface of the paper off. You've got to be especially careful here. Now here's the way to make a complete correction if I have a part of the drawing that's too much to shave. Take a piece of paper, the same thickness, the same quality. Make sure that you have a thick cardboard that you don't cut on top of your table. Take a razor, holding it at a 90 degree angle to the paper. Cut through the drawing that you've done and the paper that you've pasted underneath. Press hard enough so that you go through both sheets of paper. Keep the razor at a 90 degree cutting angle of the paper. The paper underneath the drawing will be exactly the same size as the drawing itself. You now have a clean piece of paper precisely the same size as the cutout of the drawing. Place it in the rear of the illustration. Press it down with your fingernail. Now you have a clean area on which to work. The cutout lines will not show in the reproduction, in the printing process. Now I can redraw the part of the drawing that I wanted to correct. Re-ink it. You can go right across the cut mark. You can ink across the cut mark. If the ink is too heavy and bleeds into the cut mark, then what you can do is go back with your white paint. Usually, the cut mark will not show if you ink over it with the brush. It may show the cut mark if you ink over it with the pen. Now, if the cut out area seems to appear whiter, it won't once you erase the entire drawing. There is a secret to becoming a good inker. It's called repetition and patience. 
It means practicing enough to make it seem easy. The part of the drawing which is in shadow will receive a heavier line. The part of the line that's being hit by light, and in this case the top of the uh, skull and the top of the wing, is a much thinner line. So you don't actually have to draw blacks or shading to make light and dark. You can do it with the weight of the line. Absolutely. And in animation, that's precisely the way they do it. The bottom of the uh, figure will usually be with a, with a heavier line signifying a shadowed part. The top of the figure would be with a lighter line, just as I'm doing here, signifying where the light is hitting. You'll notice that in the pencil drawing, I've also uh, roughed out, designated where my shadows and lights will be because, again, every drawing that I do, I try to make a determination of a light source so that there's a consistency all the way through the drawing. Okay, now that I've got the figure outlined by pen, I'm now going to use my brush to put in the heavier parts of the inking, and I'm going to attempt to render the uh, helmet so that it emulates metal. And now I'm putting highlights on the helmet itself to make it look more metallic and shiny. and rendering that metal. I'm using a lot of lines that are parallel to one another because I find that parallel lines gives an impression of uh, smoothness. I'm putting the shadows where I feel that they would fall, shadow falling underneath and underneath the helmet itself. If I were to attempt to put all those blacks in, 
with a pen, aside from the fact that it would be a very tedious job, it wouldn't come out as clean as doing it with the brush, in addition to the fact that it would probably chew up the paper as well. My thought was to show the difference between the rendering of the skin and the beard as opposed to the metallic, almost slick look of the helmet. And as I render, I keep in mind always the fact that uh, there is a light source, and that light source has to be consistent all the way through the drawing. And now I'm rendering the head, the face, and I want to get a kind of a wrinkled, weathered, worn face um, not a, not so much a, of an old man as a kind of a grizzled character. That's a shadow under the nose, but I don't want to make that shadow completely black because I have the feeling that it would kind of obliterate the form. Again, I'm putting these uh, parallel lines in that give an impression of uh, smooth, uh, slick metal. The differences in technique the really diff add um, interest to the drawing. Might you use crosshatch or stipple? But it can be done in any number of ways, and all of them can be correct. He is really grizzled. Yeah. Now I'm using a, uh, a fine pen to put some etching lines on the lenses of the, uh, these lights that he has on the side of his helmet. Which pen is that? That's the Croquil. Why do they call it a Croquil pen? I don't really know. <laughs> and suddenly find that the metallic effects, to me anyhow, look a lot more metallic when the pencil lines are removed. Aren't you afraid the ink will smear? Well, you've got to make sure that the ink doesn't smear by allowing the ink to dry long enough. Well, that's about it for now. I hope you've enjoyed working with me as much as I have with you. And I'm sure it's helped you improve your work, perhaps even more than you realize. Keep this video and course book a part of your valuable tools. Continue going over and over the material, and you'll be surprised how much more you'll pick up by repeating the instructions and advice I've already given you, and by practicing. It really depends on your motivation as well as your own personal effort, so don't stop now. I hope you'll stay in touch with me and keep working hard so that someday you'll realize your ambition to become one of us, a cartoonist. This course is devoted to just one aspect of comic book work. If you'd like to expand your knowledge in other areas of comic book creation, check the back of your workbook for a list of other courses in the series. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to working with you again.